Here we go. Um, welcome. I'm Bria. I work with the Alliance. I'm not going to take up too much time. I just wanted to let you know it will be recorded. And we do have a list of guidelines on the website for how to make this space a safer space. So if you haven't read them yet, please take a look during the break. Um, they're under the etiquette section and we just ask that everyone take a look at them. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Zakia. I'm so excited you're here and just actually super grateful that this is the first session. What a way to open it. So thank you. <sighs> Thank you, Priya. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. Hello, everybody. So I'm coming to you at 6 p.m. in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's summer year. Thankfully, it hasn't been that hot. Um, I actually was wearing boots the other day and a jersey, which is highly unusual for December. And uh, it's always fascinating how the better who I speak to, uh, we always start with the weather, so I think that's one of my key characteristics <laughs> is, you know, we just, it's, it's a kind of temperature check just to know what's going on. So yeah, that's me. Um, there's a thunderstorm brewing outside, uh, which will just cool things down and bring the mosquitoes in later, but, you know, uh, I think we're good for now. Um, okay, so I'm really happy to see uh, so many people here that I have not connected with before, and I am so looking forward to learning from all of you um, how I anticipate this weekend, this uh, session, I was going to say this evening and weekend, but just the session going is, I would really would like it to be as conversational as possible. I have in pre preparing, put a structure in place that's just to help me um, help me be a bit more, um, you know, not forget, yes, help me not forget to say the talk about the things I want to be talking about. That's really the structure. However, I am not completely committed to the structure. So if anybody feels a need to just divert or ask different questions or bring in experiences, um, yeah, just do it. Also, um, uh, so yeah, so that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is part of that structure is I'm kind of going to be sharing my journey to get to this point of intersectional unschooling. Um, so what I would like is for us to journey together. I'll share with you how and why I got to where I did in some stories. But I really would like to hear from, and I think everybody would like to hear from everybody else. So if there's a key moment or a thought or something that, you know, that was part of your journey, then um, yes, this is the place that to share that with, okay? So I've got like sort of a, a round of discussions and um, yeah, let me just see, okay. I've got a round of discussions, so can I share screen, uh, Bria? One second. Okay, sure. Um, and one of those round of discussions is um, to hear from you. So whoever's comfortable to share, as hopefully as many of you as possible. Cameras on, off, you really, I'm really not that phased. Um, so just tell me when, when I can. In the meantime, I'm going to read this quote. In, in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For thought is a bird of space that in a cage of words may unfold wings but cannot fly. Okay, I think we really need a visual of that um, because it's kind of wordy. Um, and this is the, yeah, okay. Okay, so Bria can't, let me just see if I can copy, the, let me go one more time. In much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For a thought is a bird of space. In a cage may unfold wings, but cannot fly, okay? And I would like us to keep this in mind in this discussion in the sense that 
um, the author is Khalil Gibran. Uh, the author, I mean, I'd like to keep that in mind because whatever we say here, whatever we articulate, whatever we, we, we write down, um, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's not, doesn't define whatever we're going to think forever. And this is what, um, thank you, Julia. <laughs> and, and this has been true for me for so long, because I found that a lot of my thinking, how I articulated, how I practiced evolved over time. And in as much, and so this is the dilemma. And so uh, one of the ways that, and so I, I thought a lot more and deeper than I had words for and felt a lot more than I had words for. And that when I do express myself uh, in writing or in speaking, it's um, sometimes afterwards I keep thinking, um, I keep wondering about what I said and what I wrote and whether that's really true. Does it, does, you know, is it internalized for me? And um, after I got over the discomfort, and this is what I'd want to bring to all of you is, it's okay, we can think something and then change our minds and we can say something that isn't complete. Continue learning and after three or four years there, I can't quite remember how long I've been there, uh, I'm, I'm feeling back to where I was from, from having my, my intrinsic motivation essentially stolen from me by the traditional schooling system. Thanks so much, Sam. And um, could you just mention also how old you are? I am 19, I turned 19 in December. Thank you. And just before and rich. And so I'm going to, and I see that happening here today with, uh, with our participation. Okay, so in that light, um, I'd like to say you can use, uh, it's fine, Bria, uh, as soon as it's not, it really isn't, and Julia shared the quote in the chat, so yeah, it really isn't that, that important. Uh, so I'd like to start with whoever, you can use the raise hand feature, which let's see, I don't even know where mine is. Um, and what I want to ask of anybody, whoever wants to open and share, is to tell me or tell us, share with us what brings you here to this idea of intersectional unschooling. A thought, a feeling, a curiosity, an experience, your journey. And you can just unmute and go. And if, if there's a clash, then we'll resolve it then. Um, hi, can I say something? Please do. Um, I think what brings me uh, to this session and this idea is a curiosity and an interest mm -hmm. in other people's journeys and to see their own intersectionality. Like, I, as I have practiced um, self-directed education in our home and with my kids and in my own learning, I have my own, um, my, my, the own, my own identity, I guess, that, that I bring into that and that kind of like influences, but then I've been thinking more about other people's um, experiences and identities and how it's just of interest to me, the, the like, oh, how other people have, have experienced this journey and their own I think their own identity in that, like, I'll just, for example, um, I, I feel like as a, a North American middle-class white person, <laughs> I've been able to practice self-directed education with my children in a way that I didn't have to think about a lot of um, ways in which it might go wrong for them, <laughs> mm -hmm. just because I had a lot of privilege and things coming into that. And, and, and I've just been kind of more aware of these in recent years. And um, it's made me more aware of other people's, the intersectionality in their own life that would 
uh, I don't know, complicate that decision making or make it maybe more, dip, more difficult for them or maybe easier or maybe more enriching. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious to yeah. hear other people's experiences. Mm. Yes, because um, what our experiences are, what our identities are, where we find ourselves located, uh, it influences a the decision making process, of course, right? Um, but also it, the practicality and the application and what we focus on and what we ignore and what, you know all those things, and it matters. And uh, even though you can't get rid of your identity or your upbringing the the awareness that yes I can do this because this is where I come from or this is the pr- level of privilege I sit with or I can't do this because this is where I am or uh, the level of disadvantage I sit with um, the awareness is really important you know um, and and for me I think it's the first step of uh, the first really important step in our journey, and I think generally in, in journeys in general, is like awareness. Um, thanks for that share, Renee. Renee, is that right? Okay, awesome. Um, who's next? Anybody else? Thanks, for, uh, Manira, for uh, sharing in the chat. And I think that's really super cool that your um, that students in education are interested in this topic, uh, because in itself, it's an intersection, right? You know, schooling, institutionalized learning, learning on community-based learning, uh, solo-based, self-directed learning, they all, they so connected. And ideally we can, (laughs) if they can all feed into each other, that would be just ideal. And and it's only when we have our spaces open, to each other that we can then grow and learn together and it becomes kind of a more enriching space for the community in general. Yeah, thanks for that, Manira. Uh, who was next? Is, I didn't actually notice hands going up. Anybody? Hi. Hi, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm here in Austin, Texas. Um, I recently started uh, working at a unschooling uh, learning community called Abrome. Um, And so what brings me here is that we are working to curate our community to be a diverse um, community um, in a way that doesn't tokenize people and in a way that um, makes us stronger um, on all fronts. Um, So that's just what brings me here. I'm learning about um, about this and coming at it from an anthropological perspective myself. Okay. So your ident- how would you identify yourself? Because I'm like I'm here in South Africa. You I, I can't I can't like just from screens and accents figure out who's what you know, <laughs> except for Raj, I think. <laughs> oh well, I'm just a, a white heterosexual woman. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Anybody else? Since you said my name. Saying... Okay. Yeah. Okay, Raj. Um, so I'm South Asian American, um, born here in California, so just an apparent of a self-directed learner. Um, and so just that is out of the norm in this country with most South Asians that came to this country came for reasons of higher ed and things of that sort. Um, so that's already out of the norm and intersections there and dealing with that. And then I also, um, we live in Oakland. We live in a community of color. We run a space called Liberated Kids. Um, mm-hmm. just, so we just started this year. <clears throat> and it's an SE space specifically for Black, Indigenous, and kids of color. Um, so our whole community is on these intersections. And we're really trying to figure out, we keep diving. And the big thing that we're really diving into is like, what does SDE look like for our kids? What does it mm. mean to be black and brown in the United States and practicing SDE? What does it mean to be a black child of 10 that doesn't quote unquote know how to read versus a white kid that doesn't know how to read when they're 10? Yeah. Um, yeah. So just kind of a lot of these intersections and a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how um, some spaces, it's just by nature you it's already diverse and um just how we land is would be intersectional 
and others have to be intentional about, like Lauren has to be intentional about uh, creating a space that's safe for a diverse kind a range of people. And, you know, I don't know if that's creating the space, it's just ensuring that your space feels safe for anybody to want to approach um, and uh, being intentional about uh, and intentional in a way about the fact that there are various intersectionals, intersections uh, of identity, of challenges, of systems that affect us differently and ensuring that, and you know, you're trying to figure out how do you create that space and awareness. So yeah, that's very cool. Uh, it's interesting to see the difference between the space of uh, Raj and Lauren's space. Thanks for that share, both of you. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Ariel, go for Hi, it. My internet, yeah, I'm in Argentina and in a small city, my internet is not great. So if you can't hear me, tell me and I'll, I'll just write it in the chat. Um, okay. I'm in this room part particularly because we, I, I'm a new immigrant to a country where I do speak the language. Um, my husband is from here, my daughter is grappling with her, she's 11 and she's grappling with her identity so much in so many ways, but right now as a as someone straddling two worlds, two languages, um, really rejecting right now her Amer her North Americanness and wanting me to not be what I am, which is my identity, I guess, would be a Jewish American white lady who speaks Spanish and uh, is has been married to an immigrant and now is an immigrant. So there's um, a lot of uh, new identities emerging, I would say, in our family, and mm. I'm, and I'm also so, and then also being unschoolers in this place that is very traditional, very um, religious town, um, where you know all every time there's any sort of discomfort, everyone's answer is, well, if she was in school, it would be better, uh -huh. um, yeah, <laughs> for her <laughs> and for you. So it's just been two months, two and a half months that we've been here. I'm trying to be very gentle, but it's been rough. Uh, and just immediately coming into this space, I felt um, relief and sadness. Uh, and I, yeah, I hope you feel held throughout this whole weekend and especially in the session, Ariel. Yeah, the challenges, uh, the challenges the challenges are never ending and from every direction. Um, and community is what keeps you sane. And that's something I didn't actually have, to be honest, uh, when we started. My eldest is 24 now. And so, so, and he's never, none of my kids have ever been to school. So when we started, um, well, we started unschooling without knowing that this thing existed. So we just, we started kind of, um, this makes sense to us, like school doesn't make sense to us. It didn't, it didn't serve us very well. And, um, and there's a better way to grow up and there's a better way to live. And so we ended up, um, we ended up do, doing a DIY and then part of our research landed us into this concept of unschooling and we're like, oh, so that's what it's called. And also, oh, so we haven't invented something new. And <laughs> I was kind of disappointed because I thought, wow, we pioneers, you know? And that just tells you just how colonized we were because completely oblivious of our ancestors and, you know, that had come here, um, carved spaces for themselves in South Africa without schooling. Um, you know, and I think about my grandmother who spoke four languages other than English, who considered herself illiterate um, because she didn't speak English. And I remember as a, as a teenager uh, thinking I'm way smarter than her because, you know, I spoke the good English and I refused to learn any of the other languages. So, because, you know, you're smart if you speak English. And so, that was, you know, that, and then, and then coming up with this way of, of educating and then thinking that like I'm a pioneer in this completely oblivious to the rich history of parenting and education um, that existed before me. And, you know, and then thinking, okay, this, uh, 
John Holt is the dude, you know, that I'm going to look up to, completely oblivious <laughs> of, you know, his uh, circumstances. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, it it really is a journey. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna. So my next round of questions, and then maybe other people can can share, is uh, about this term unschooling itself. So. Um, what I want to ask you is if you can maybe put in the chat uh, a one, if you use the word unschooling, uh, a two, a zero, if you hate the word unschooling, and a two, if you use any other word. And if you use any other word, then please share what that is. So zero, if you hate unschooling, one, if you use it, and two, if you use any other terminology, and what would that be? Okay. <laughs> Hate is strong, but I dislike it. Yes, any. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something consent based, self directed, family centered, non coercive. Yes. So, whether you, so regardless of the terminology you use, what are some of the defining characteristics? that you think um, that that really, you know, yeah, that that separates what you do, the word you use, that from everything else, something defining. Yes, Megan, I'm also a lover. Um, and you can put that in the chat as, as people are speaking. So defining characteristics, consent, of course, of unschooling or life learning or whatever it is that you use. And who would like to share something? If anybody has an interesting or um, a story about how they want to share what matters to them about the language they use, whether it's unschooling or self-directed education or any of the terminology. So uh, please do feel free to unmute yourself and talk now. Carol, I see your hand going, yeah. I, you know, some people complain about the, and you know, I need to reread your piece on why you like it because I think we're sort of aligned on this, but um, I like the negative sense of unschooling because um, it sort of connects for me with that. It's like a, the idea of not knowing that we're not creating a new ideology with a, a new set of rules and restrictions. We were walking out of this institution without fully knowing what the next step is going to look like. And we're entering into a process of kind of culture building, which is going to have to involve a lot of adjustments and constant you know, awareness and, and willingness to change and reflect as opposed to, oh, here's our new set of answers to how life should be. Here's our new system for mm. what we do. And, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And, and it, it starts to become dogmatic. So that's, that's, a, that's what I like about the term unschooling. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, hey? We don't want to be replacing this one master, the schooling master with something else and that the undefinedness of unschooling I think is one of the biggest appeals. Um, I also had to reread my piece this morning about why I like the word unschooling and I was like oh yes I forgot I like that part of it <laughs> and so in a nutshell the un you know there's two two like major objections to this word unschooling one is the un and then there's a beautiful list I think that Oklahoma homeschoolers put together of all these words with un like un, unencumbered and unrefined or undefined and you know beautiful lots of beautiful unwords that we could relate to and then the second objection is that it has the word schooling in it and we should if we want to live in a world without school we should just you know not use it and I um I mean, I kind of like that as well, but for me, um, I think school 
honestly defined so much of me, of so many people, of our societies. I mean, I was watching Star Trek and, you know, they've really broken through frontiers, you know, in Star Trek. But you know what? Even in space, they had compulsory schooling. I mean, the one episode it's like drove me crazy because, you know, I think they, the kids want, you know, some somebody, some species wanted the kids to go live with them because they were free. And, 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 and I think one of the things is you won't be forced to do algebra. And I was like, why are we being forced? <laughs> Like how many frontiers are you crossing, but you still want your oppressed children, you know? And it's that's how ingrained it is. Um, and I think I like keeping that uh, in the forefront of my mind. That so much of how I think, so much of how our society is, is upheld by the way schools currently function. And so that unschooling, the schooling part, is the resistance part to it. Um, and so that's kind of why I keep keep to that. So um, going through this, co consent, child-centered, child-led, non-coercive, trust-based, they're all concepts, right? Um, they just they just concepts, you know, consent, um, child-centered, child-led. You know, how does like what does it look in practical practical terms, and what? What are the filters that lead us to um, must be joyful, of course. What are those filters that help us put that into practice? Okay, and this is where I was. Um, okay, so let me just open the, share my screen quick just to this and then we'll come out of it again, uh, just to share some of my notes that I made. Um, really the last point. Um, so you agree with life and education philosophy, right? Because we're not, um, I think consent applies to whether we're forcing you to do algebra and whether we're forcing you to dress in a way that complies with our idea of what looks good rather than what feels right for you, right? And that's a live thing. Um, and then I just found as I was reading different things that I'd written in different places, However, everybody would have their own idea of what this defining characteristics of unschooling is. And I think the last one, so keep this in mind, unschooling is an ethical response to the broken world. That's from Bio Akumalafe. Um, I forget the name of his book now. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll try and remember later and put it in that. Okay, um, so let's, and that is, uh, so unschooling as an ethical response is gonna be linked to inter intersectional unschooling just now. There's something that I wanted to put, uh, bring attention to. And that is um, when we talk about, while we don't, def like we don't prescribe and nobody monitors whether somebody is unschooling or not, um, they are defining characteristics that I think uh, I feel protective over. And those are things like consent and non-coercion, especially in recognizing that children are people too, that they're human beings, that um, they have a right to exist as children. And you know, those, those are defining characteristics. And I come into, thanks Manira, I come into, I come into problems, is that the word I'm looking for? I come into conflict with people, parents who are, who don't embrace uh, the freedom, who use coercion, who use compulsion, and who say they're unschooling, and who get really annoyed with me when I want to engage with them on that. Because you know it's 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 undefined, and you can define it how you want to. And yes, you can. However, it can't mean just anything. Because if it can mean anything, then it also means nothing. And it means something. You know what? Does that make sense? It really does mean a philosophy and a way of life that honors young people, 
and and recognizes their right to have their own thoughts uh you know because they can't have freedom of speech if they're not free to think how they want to that recognizes their emotions and their right to exist as human beings and you know once you violate, i think if you violate that young people's freedoms um and they're just their person then you moved into something else this is what defines or you know whatever that language is it has to be what's different is how we relate to young people and how we carry ourselves in their presence and so um and you know it can still be such a broad concept like like carol said it's still not defining it's just saying don't do these things <laughs> you know uh that's all it's saying, like it's still in the unworld. What it can be, what consent looks like, what child-centered looks like, is still, you know, um, what's the word? Is still open to all of us to interpret and practice based on our histories, our identities, where we find ourselves, okay? So that is just something I really um, wanted to bring because this is something we need to recognize. That young people are marginalized. You know, when we look at what, uh, what is a marginalized community or an identity or folks or people, you know, young people tick all these categories. They're socially excluded. Um, there were a bunch of kids here the other day and they were telling us a story about how somebody said to one of them that the adults are talking now and they were just talking about business not even something really you know and didn't want her in that space um young people uh they are relegated to the margins of society and you see it um in the lang especially in the language we use that they're so relegated that we can make we can say insulting things about young people like use the word childish, for example. It's so accepted to use that, that that's how relegated they are that we don't even see what we're doing uh, to young people. They lack influence over the functioning of society and essentially their futures, you know, um, they, yeah. And then they lack power over the issues that directly affect them as a whole. And then, and then, and this is now where uh, intersectional unschooling comes in with all that. So this is all children, one, two, th the first four are all children, right? And then you get children that have uh, some or one or more identities that our systems of oppression also affect. It could be their gender, their race, their uh, ability, they're, whether they're neurotypical or neurodiverse, um, sexuality, all these other identities are added on to the, to the other marginalizations. And so, uh, and, and so those, you know, those could be our kids, you know, who are dealing with that and have to deal with that additional systems of oppression. Or they could be just kids in our community, and so it still matters. Or it could be kids that we can't even, you know, don't know, we have no relation to, but they're young people who have to live within those systems of oppression and disadvantage or advantage. And so uh, it matters, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. <laughs> and just get some anything that's coming up from anybody to just share with with where we've come so far. Something must have come up with somebody. I'll share since I was the only zero. <laughs> okay, um, thanks, Annie. Okay. Annie, um, yeah. I identify as white. I'm raising two white boys. Um, I am part of a running an ALC here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I am growing in comfort with the term unschooling, but I think um, that last piece that you just talked about really helps me frame why I don't like it because I think 
when I first came to know of it, I was hearing it from, um, you know, the families that I saw using the term and employing what they think of as unschooling um, felt a little bit not what you just described and, and um, just didn't, also didn't consider anything beyond their family's nucleus and how unschooling in a greater context exists, I think. Um, and so, and then it's the work I've been doing to wrap my head around it. And I really appreciated what you just said and it kind of um, resonated similarly to uh, Akila Richards' recent podcast um, where she, she mentioned that similarly, nobody can just define what unschooling is for you though there are some important elements that must exist for it to be unschooling. And um, that helps me wrap my head around it a lot. Thank you. You are welcome, thanks. Um, I, wanted I to, do, uh, yeah, please do, go <clears throat> for it. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask a question. It's something that um, sits with me a lot. I have a lot of experience with SDE. I'm a facilitator and have been for the past five years. Um, I also have my own children who are not currently at my school. They're in a traditional setting and they'll come back to my school. Lots of reasons why, but they'll come back to my school this year. But the thing that really sits hard with me is one of my kids is really um, very, very deeply. And I think he's 11 now, and this is, it's young, but I think it's fair to say in a pathological way, really struggles with anxiety. Um, it is, it is truly debilitating. It has been since he's extremely, since he was very, very young. Um, and I really struggle in the home, you know, they're in traditional ed right now. So in the home, I try to give them a lot of, a lot of choice. Um, and I struggle with his, I almost want to say like, I sort of think of his anxiety as something that lives outside of him and it tries to make choices for him. And what I'm trying to say is there are so often times when I feel like his anxiety is running his choice center. Um, and I don't know how to move into this space of trusting him when I feel like he's being run by his anxiety. Um, I know it's not exactly what this session is about, that it intersects yeah. for me in a lot of ways. My children are black and I'm white. Um, and so there's, there's so many different, you know, places where that piece about choice and what I have control over and what they have control over um, and, and um, you know, lack of consent and, and figuring out what is consent in terms of like, there's some part of him that's giving me consent to take over in certain situations, even though it might not be his, vo his voice saying it. So I don't know if you had thoughts about that or could speak to it. Um, I mean, I have some thoughts of the, about it, if that's okay. One uh -huh. is like, acknowledge, like I do feel especially BIPOC kids in America right now, like, yeah, you have the right to be anxious. The world is anxiety producing and it is a normal response to a broken world. And so like leaning, and we do that in, with our students too, like leaning into like, yes, it is an anxious time and that's totally okay. Here are some skills that you can, you know, like present, we're big in contemplative education. So you'll hear me talk about contemplative education a lot, um, but it's meditation and like, here's how you're gonna have to navigate an anxious world, right? So like, here are some skills of how to not like carry it in your body all the time, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and it's like discovering what skills work for them, so that they don't have to carry it in their body all the time and they can put it down for a little bit acknowledging that yes the world is still and it's going to continue to be more anxious like the world is changing at rates that adults don't even understand mm -hmm. and kids kind of get it a, a lot more but it is anxiety producing so just acknowledging and living and and breathing with that and like understanding that that is okay right like that anxiety is okay because the world is the way it is you know, and that's how we move through it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a mental health and neurodiversity panel, which would be mm. uh, useful. However, what I would like to say, it's going to sort of echoing Monera is for me, I have, you know, my 
youngest uh, definitely is um, has social anxieties. I wouldn't say or in general anxieties, and um, I you know I like I struggle with it because sometimes I think she's giving up on opportunities that I know she'd benefit from. But at the same time, I, I've committed myself and it's really hard, but I do it, is I'm like, okay, what do you need? Um, it's okay that you're missing that opportunity. Actually, it's just a good opportunity if you're feeling calm and relaxed. It actually isn't a good opportunity when you're feeling anxious, you know? So that's just my projecting. I mean, like we were, you know, yeah, it's a journey. That wouldn't have been my response if that was my first child, right? So just, I'm just putting it out there. Um, <laughs> I would have said this unschooling thing doesn't work because now he can, you know, da, da, da. So um, I just like, I keep thinking, I said, there's two things. One is, you know, this world doesn't make space for you to show up in your, the way you are. I'm acknowledging that, but in this house, you do. That's all I have control over. And that in this house, you can be, you can be as anxious as you want. I mean, not want you, who chooses that? You can be how, you know, however you are. And I have to hold space for that. And that means changing things. So mentioning if people are coming over, if she's going to be in her room because there are people here, then I'll text her and see if she needs snacks or a cell phone charger or whatever it is, because, uh, that's all I know to do. And just to let her know that, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you, yeah, this space is a space where you can just exist just the way you are. And whatever irritations I have are my own. And then I chat to one of my friends or work through it myself or, you know, because, you know, of course you can, it's like, there's no way I'm going to pretend I'm comfortable with it all. I'm not. Um, but that's, it's a me problem. <laughs> And so I find you. So I would say, Julia, you need to find ways to help you be okay with this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just texted that in the chat that in the moment that you said it, like, oh, oh this, this is okay. Me. Trust myself and be more okay with it being mm. hard. To yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to ask also what, so in addition to whatever came up for you, if anybody has a story to share about or an experience about, you know, these intersectional marginalizations that you've noticed your kids having in maybe in, in the unschooling world, in the SDE space, so we could maybe unpack how we be more intentional and aware about how we as unschoolers and a community of unschoolers or SDE folks, uh, practitioners uh, participate in that. So I could like, I can go first with uh, the Learning Reimagine conferences that I hosted. Um, one of the things I never, you know, we just had bathrooms. We had the male and female bathrooms and that was it. And uh, also, um, the venue, the first venue coincidentally was uh, wheelchair friendly, but the second one, uh, somebody messaged to ask me, you know, whether that would be, they would be fine. And, you know, when I went to look at the venue, I never looked like, uh, it just didn't occur to me. So yeah, that was saying, that was sort of almost excluding, you know, excluding. Yeah. So that's, that's just my story and how I've, I, yeah, that's my story. So anybody else wants to share experiences or anything? Okay, I didn't read what Raja Munira wrote. I'll catch up on the chat later. Um, well, anybody else has anything to say? Well, can I say something as a lifelong Please? vegetarian? Yeah. I've often, I mean, I've, I've I'm a vegetarian my whole life. My daughter is being raised vegetarian. It's part of her identity. And it's amazing how many people discount that when inviting you to a space with meals. And I mean, it's becoming something that is less, you know, there's more awareness around veganism and vegetarianism in the world at large. And I'm grateful for that. 
but it's just interesting that we've always had to think about the food we're going to bring, what we're going to be able to eat in spaces uh -huh. and just, um, it's like, it's our problem. Um, right. Because we have a diff made a different choice. Um, and I grew up that way. So I grew up feeling strange about that, but also comfortable. Um, and it's just interesting how, I mean, it's a small part of our identity, but it actually isn't because we, we eat, we eat all the time, right? We all eat yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So that has helped me to see how every parts of ourselves that we take for granted that everyone's the same as us and we're not all the same. And just, I think it's so much about curiosity and just asking questions. And if you're really creating welcoming spaces, you know, knowing the people you're inviting and asking what do they need is a mm -hmm. way we start a community from a place of care. Yeah. And so it's also knowing the questions to ask. So like those are, you have to know to ask whether, you know, people have food restrictions or, um, yeah, knowing, knowing to look for those things and I like, yeah, food is one of the things we just grew up with being, you know, having grown up um, Muslim and looking for going to places where, you know, there would be halal food. It's like, you just like, that's just something, uh, you know, is going to happen. And um, so food is the one thing I'm very careful about with most people, but then that's my, that's my own, see how my history feeds that, right? So I can be aware but I never had a problem accessing a bathroom. So it never occurred to me to think about the bathroom or I never had a problem climbing stairs. So it never occurred to me. And so, um, and so it shouldn't be. So what I, what I bothered me about myself is it shouldn't, I, you know, it shouldn't be that only when it becomes a problem for me that I become aware of it. And that was my problem with myself is like, how did I run a, a, a conference called unschooling as decolonization without thinking about the venue <laughs> like how did I get there but in my defense I'm also trying to so when I learned how host these things um, it's because I these are things I want to learn about myself so I'm not the expert I'm just the convener but it's that's just to help me sleep at 3 a.m when those thoughts do pop in I still do think <laughs> it's not right um yeah Any? Well, <clears throat> I was involved in an unschooling group that formed in the 90s. So, um, you know, it was kind of the dark ages there in terms of, um, although I guess I shouldn't use the word dark, in term, but it was, it was a very unenlightened period in terms of, there's the word light. Okay. <laughs> Um, it, it was not yeah. a great period in terms of people having a lot of awareness of all these issues, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of the post-racial society and, you know, the groups that I was part of were never all white, but it wasn't something that was discussed and there was no format for bringing up those issues. So, um, yeah, it just... So the, the interesting thing to me has been to watch it unfold and everybody has this learning process where they have to own the mistakes that they've made and the, you know, the, the ways that they've failed to uh, address things appropriately. And, you know, I don't know, I mean, I, I'd be interested if anybody has a link that they could put in the chat for, um, with something like an unschooling group, which is a little bit more free form than an ALC or a, you know, democratic school. Um, for some kind of way to open this conversation with new members as they join and, you know, how to kind of fold in the whole discussion. Um, you know, what, what, what do people come, what do people come up with in terms of kind of standard operating procedures for making sure that everybody's needs are, are addressed and that people feel that they can raise their concerns. And mm -hmm. I know Akila, um, and um, they put together a, a sort of a training program for, um, for, for schools and groups. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear what people, people are using as a way to open the conversation. Hmm. I'm just thinking. Um, 
I, I think, again, it depends on who's creating that space, right? Um, because in some spaces, before you even open your mouth, it's kind of clear uh, what that group, what the, uh, I joined this, um, a quiz night that happens uh, some evenings, uh, once a month online. And, you know, part of the description was, you know, we pro black, we pro queer, we pro a whole lot of things. So um, I already knew exactly what the conversation, you know, um, it's, I knew beforehand. And I think uh, that's a good way to deal, to preempt, to create. So it's a good way to actually invite the kind of people you're looking for to start with, right? And um, it's a good way for clarity so that you can, then you don't need to open the space to say, you know, listen, you can, if you have an objection, because it's clear from there that objections would be addressed regardless. So, you know, you, you're not addressing that. So I think, yeah, so I, 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 would, I would lean more towards uh, starting, upfront with that's where we what we we stand for yeah yeah okay yes so i'm gonna just move to the okay my mouse doesn't want to work let's see oh there we go so um so part of my journey was that some kind of awareness at some point, because I don't think, I, I, I mean, I, not that I don't think, I know I didn't start that, you know, as a social justice and human rights perspective, I'm going to unschool. That's not where I started. Um, there was no political dimension to it. It was just for me, uh, this is, it doesn't make sense how we live and learn. So I'm going to try something new. And, you know, once you question the education system, you start questioning a whole lot. Or I wouldn't say that because I did have a lot of, um, I, at that point, I didn't link our education journey to all the other political, and I come from South Africa, we just, when we started, apartheid had just ended, and schools which were segregated had just become um, desegregated I guess um, and you know one of the things I came under a lot of criticism for is that people fought for our right to go to any school and I was like it's the same you know does it matter it's the same school it's the same system like does it matter that there's a, you know nice lawns and better chairs and you know because um, previously whites only schools were really well equipped beautiful sports fields etc and then the schools we went to were fairly mediocre. And then there were some schools that were just containers on bricks, um, no ventilation, no heating, um, you know, so these are the levels. So of course, if you are gonna go to school and you, uh, your previous op only option was going to the container with no ventilation and now you have the option to go to something different. Yes, of course you should go, I support that, right? I just decided we don't want to go there and we came under a lot of criticism for not wanting to use the privilege that we now have to go to a better school than we went to. So anyway, um, it, so, but, but over time, I started seeing the political dimension and the connection between what this relationship is between our, us and our children at a micro level, because if every, uh, if everybody's, if less and less children are coming out into adulthood, uh, feeling their feelings, comfortable with themselves, aware of themselves, feeling okay to be who they are, then they would be doing a lot less of what we adults currently do, right? Um, so that already changes the kind of society we have because the building blocks are now healthier and stronger, just like all the cells in our body, each one of our cells, has some little, you know, uh, issue, the body as a whole is problematic. So currently our body as human beings is problematic because each of us as individuals have gone through coercive parenting, colonial schooling, we've internalized systems of oppression that we allow on ourselves and we project on others when we 
have the opportunity to and young people bear the brunt of it from everybody regardless of who, what the identity is so in resisting this and taking them out of this getting rid of that level of marginalization for young people changes a lot okay and i started seeing that connection that unschooling is uh, is social change okay and so the resistance I came up with here um, is, you know, like, it's okay. Like, so the discussion is, you know, of course, I mean, I don't have a problem with children building tree houses. I think this discussion came up and I want to give some context to this is that, um, that there was, um, so, I think it was a shooting somewhere in the United States and and then there was one of the schools in that area like i think it's an sde school their response was you know the, they had a discussion with the young kids there was posters made they had a kind of a mini protest and in you know that was an awareness of what was happening in the space and um and then so this is all what I was just observing on Facebook when I used to be active on it. And one of the other schools had pictures about the kids building tree houses, completely oblivious to what's happening in their country and in the environment. And so, um, and so when I mentioned this as something that bothered me, the resistance I got in the space, some of the, you know, some of the groups that I connect with here was that, you know, it's enough that they build, it's okay that they don't know what's happening because they're still going to be whole people and they're still going to you know feel their feelings and they're being respected etc and so we need to protect them and not burden them with the world's world's problems and so i i yeah i don't agree i didn't agree then i still don't agree and um and so it's one of the points in in in, in south african community uh, that separates. So there's the one group where, you know, we just need to, uh, we don't need to deal with these things because it'll go away. It'll magically go away um, if we just treat children well. And I was like, this is where unschooling comes from. It's like we've been formed by schooling and we've been formed by a particular mindset. You know, we've been formed by capitalism and by inequalities of course we're going to bring that into with into our young children if we don't address it and and of course we're going to say you just worry about yourselves um and it will be fine and so for me this is you know just experience reading connect i think carol's um uh, schooling the world the movie and then connecting with uh, Swaraj University in India or the writings around that organization and Manish and, uh, and the website brought a whole lot of things together for me and the reason I just fell so easily into it is because uh, because you know I, did, I think I didn't have the words for it but there was this bird flying freely in my brain about it and I was like, yes, that's what's missing. It's not just meant to be this nice experience. Um, and so that's how I got to the idea that unschooling uh, is social change. Um, and then I got it developed further into um, the whole idea of decolonization, which was, uh, which has always been a big topic of discussion in South Africa and with, with all it was you know I think like for my kids it's something a concept that general vocabulary because you know South Africa and that's one of the big things yeah and so the connections came slowly that yes this is how unschooling can potentially be decolonizing and I've written about that and it's on my website um and eventually, the resistance I kept getting to from unschoolers to the idea that we need to look at all these broader intersections of what we're dealing with and what we're faced with, um, 
I, it, it, it was, I remember when I wrote the piece on intersectional unschooling, uh, see, it brings up, it just changes my <laughs> physiology because it still sits inside of me. It is a painful process because I was so, it's, it's so much pain at A, the resistance I was getting and B, at the, I would say the indifference um, because, hey, we okay, we can unschool or we can have our little center and build our tree houses and it's enough and that other children didn't matter. And so, and so I thought that actually in the same way unschoolers, you know, John Holt came up with this word in my understanding to differentiate those, that group of people that were practicing what they were practicing, to differentiate them from the people who were doing school at home and who were focused on school at home and who just replaced the schoolmaster with the parent master that he needed to differentiate, you know, and, and I think it was good for that community to, so they could find each other. And I felt like, I think we need a phrase or a term like intersectional unschooling for us to find each other and also to get that discourse going more openly and it be more accepted that, hey, you know, that version of unschooling that doesn't really care about the rest of the world, that's not us. And so I like that word unschooling for various reasons that I've written about. And I felt a need to put this word intersectional in front of it because I needed to differentiate myself first and foremost from the group that didn't see the broader intersections. And so it came out of pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's where I, why I, I use that, that word. And um, so let me just go share quickly what else I put there. Uh, Renee, it's growingminds.co.za. I'll put it now. Um, I, I'll change, I can't multitask. So, and I'm trying to, sh whoops. Yeah, there we go, it opened. Um, unschooling. So, so just to do some theory, um, is that that word, the idea of intersectionality comes from Kimberly Crenshaw. And it was, I think, 1989 already when she was writing about and, and talking about it. But just to pay tribute to the idea, I just created this to mention that it's, you know, all oppression is linked. So the oppression of young people, as it stands, whether they privilege young people or, or not, is linked to the oppressions that come, that emerge as a result. And I think this is important, that, um, that there's a body of knowledge and there's a theory. Um, oh my God, I got Carol, do you remember the, oh, Chester Pierce, Dr. Chester Pierce, yeah, who wrote about uh, childism um, in the 70s, I think, mentioned that the root of all the, all the oppressions we find ourselves has its roots in the oppression that is faced by young people. And so regardless of whether you want to be intersectional or not, you already are because that is where, if, you, if you're concerned about young people um, and their oppression, it's because, you know, you're dismantling that does remove some of the roots. So in maybe in a privileged society, there'd be less um, uh, gender oppression, you know, so you're still doing some work, but the idea is that, that you can't, that's not enough, right? And so all our social categorizations are connected and that our categorizations are only a problem for us because the systems that govern us is what creates the problem. There's nothing wrong with being a woman or being, um, you know, having, being neurodiverse or having a disability or anything like that. It's the systems that actually cause those issues. And so we really need to address those systems, okay? And so whatever, Whatever your area of work is, if your work is around uh, nationality or disability, 
you have you can't only be looking at disability you have to look at all the other systems of oppression including age and i think this picture would have been much nicer if adultism was there as well um, actually it would be more complete to right so regardless of that and this is what i really wanted to um to talk about i mean just to give pay some tribute to so um, for me, intersectional unschooling is that the resisting and the dismantling of adultism happens alongside the resistance and dismantling of other systems of oppression. And to recognize and resist the systems that our children and the children within our communities face. Um, yeah. Okay, so that was my, um, I think I've got out everything I want to say. So. <laughs> so we've got 20 minutes so for closing thoughts from everybody, whoever wants to say anything. I just wanted to bring up um, how much your anecdote about the tree houses and the Dr. Seuss um, is just still really resonating with me because I think if we truly see the full humanity of children, then we are going to engage with them in the full experience of life, which includes the, real, the reality of the shared experience we're all experiencing. Mm. And that allows them, including the pain of it and the injustice. Um, and not not including them in that dialogue devalues the, the richness they can bring to those discussions and um, disempowers them from engaging in solutions mm -hmm. and moving us all forward together. And um, so thank you for sharing that and helping my, my thoughts form. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Because and excluding them is relegating them further to the margins of society because our society is broken, right? So there's no point in pretending that it's not and then, you know, creating this. That should be lovely, honestly, but the, the reality is different. And so, yeah, then it's just another, another relegation in another, another level of relegation to the margins. So, yeah, that added to my thinking as well. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Anybody else? Yeah, not Sarah again. Another. Yeah. Um, I have two um, thoughts, so I'll share um, both of them. The first is I live in Colorado and the United States, and we just experienced our first winter wildfire. And um, it was the most destructive fire in the history of the state, possibly the country, over a thousand of, of my community members lost their homes. Oh. So I'm just up to say, there's no pretense any longer that this system is working. It's very visceral and felt that the system is failing, that we're living in a moment of failure. Oh. And my young people are five and three and are very like, in a felt sense, connected to the failure. And I feel like it's a loving gesture to, to bring skills to this moment and to say, like I'm, I'm working with, like there's no longer any post-trauma. This is what like climate um, kind of activists are saying. We're living in a, in a, in a time of crisis. Uh -huh. and so um, it's about, developing skills in our nervous system to go from activation to a sense of safety, even if that safety is momentary. Like oh. there's no longer a, um, a prolonged sense of safety. It's like a moment by moment in this moment, I am safe in this moment, I can feel my feet on the ground or I can get a hug, do you have your reindeer? And I just want to share that, that um, I think that the climate crisis is accelerating all of the other failures it's just mm. like it's just, it's a moment to to feel loss and to feel it collectively 
and to come together. So I just wanted to mention that. And the second thing I have, I'm really excited to ask this particular group of brilliant minds this question that I'm having, which is, um, I'm going to um, ask a question now, OK? Are you willing to listen? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I love your term intersectional in schooling. I, I feel I can grok um, the concept and what you yeah, mean, and I feel aligned with it. Where my living question um, that I haven't come up with any angles of answers toward is, I'm very interested in my children being around people who aren't like them. Uh. People who have different ideas and who live in different ways. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm only surrounding myself like with me? other like, like you, with, like other with other intersectional unschoolers, is that in itself? I'm trying to think like creating. Another I'm, bubble. Another bubble. I, I, yeah. I, I hung out because we were unschoolers who did a bunch of classes at a resource center. So like I hung out with radical right-wing cr Christians, right? Like my kids were exposed to this whole breadth of idea around unschooling and I just let it happen, right? Like, cool, go see how they joined Awana's Bible club. It's some sort of Bible memorization debate club that Christians have. I mean, whatever, like try it, do it, like, you know, but it does mean encountering a bunch of folks that have radically different ideas than you do and navigating that together. And at the end of the day, we all found a lot of common ground of like, we just want the world to be better for our children, right? And I think that that is true of every parent who ever has a child and there's circumstances that get in that way. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think um, I'm in a community, I'm near, nearby you, <laughs> um, where I'm just encountering a lot of angles in folks right now. I think people are really weary with the pandemic and it's like, are you vaccinated? Are you not vaccinated? Are you wearing masks? Are you not wearing masks? There's just a lot of like, if you're not aligned in exactly the same way as me, like I don't wanna hang out with you. Uh. Um, I think your kids are young, so I can understand your concern, but are we just not enough, or I don't think so, that you'd only be exposed or only hang out with other intersectional unschoolers. They're going to be going to tennis lessons with, you know, school kids or uh, at the mall or when you go to the movies, or it's really very difficult to keep them in a bubble um, or that... It, well, okay, that was my experience here because we not that large a community. So honestly, our annual unschoolers camp is the bubble that everyone waits for because that's just one weekend. You can't be in this bubble. Um, so, but I think it's, I, I love that you thinking about that to make sure that they actually do experience the full uh, range of what, uh, life in your community has to offer so I don't think you I, I wouldn't be worried about that too much but and then that you're aware of it is is enough to drive you to do the different choices yeah Margaret hi I'm Hi. a lot um, like Carol Black. I think my children started to be unschoolers again in the 90s. And at that time, both in Canada, Australia and the United States, where I home educated them, um, we were unschoolers. Um, but they grew up, they ended up taking even hockey, um, where you would be in communities and in locker rooms with people that it was inevitable that the children were going to be meeting people and engaging us as well as parents. We would mm. be at gatherings and which really are modeling of how we interact even with their parents and the children experience it through us. 
not just the children as well. They're going to be meeting people from different backgrounds, but we too would be in moments where people would say things like, oh, I just could never do that. Or how could the kids actually socialize? And you were constantly um, engaging with people who thought what you were doing was extreme or strange. And you had to have your composure and learn to listen to what their questions were and why, what, what was coming up mm. in their mind in response. So it's, it's not like it's gonna, you're going to end up with some sort of a philosophy of how I'm going to move through life but that rather I'm going to experience things and I will be constantly even adjusting the way I think about things and my boundaries will be moving back and forth. Um, and that was something that only now I can say after the fact, don't worry so much. Um, you know, if, if you, if you're navigating, you're going to be constantly challenged even after the fact it's all done, the kids are grown up, but could it have been different for them? Had we done a little bit more engagement in particularly more formal learning scenarios or whatever, um, but that's not really the issue. You're not going to make a bubble, but I agree with you that the bubbles are actually something when you are at that intersectionality and you're not afraid to be out in the planet with your unschooling kids, you want that safe zone as well sometimes to so just come home and be at activities where everybody's sort of on the same page with you. So there's no perfect path. You, you find yourself your needs and you go back and forth in and out. Um, but I also wanted to ask Carol Black about the notion of schooling the world, the white man's last burden was always a big piece for me to share with people who were meeting us as de-schoolers for the first time or unschoolers. Um, it, it seems to me that power is a big part of mm -hmm. what we are unaware when we started to de-school or not go to school. We, we simply wanted to give children a space of, of power, I guess, in the sense that in this certain time frame of youth, they didn't have to be learning something that the power structure was saying you must learn at this time during this period for this long. Has, has, have, do we shift uh, at the end of the day when we think of ourselves as unschoolers? Is a lot of it rooted in sort of being more comfortable with shifting power from adults and giving it to children? Is that a big part of how we think of unschooling for a lot of people out there? Well, I mean, I think sure for, uh, you know, the whole idea of consent-based education and childism, it's all about um, not assuming power over children and, and the power that we assume over children. Um, there's people who've done a lot of work on this. A guy named Toby Rollo has written a lot of papers about this, but um, the, 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 the language of political domination tends to be where your women are cast as children relative to men, people of color are cast as children relative to white people. Um, it's this idea that you know they need us to to guide them and um, and support them. They need this this fatherly figure. Although the history of white feminism and white women participating in in colonization is is pretty appalling as well. So, um, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot about power. Um, so turn it over to other people. And, but the other, the other thing I just want to raise in terms of the climate crisis and everything, like a lot of indigenous people will point out, you know, the end of the world already happened for us a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, we're already living in a post-apocalyptic <laughs> world and have been for generations. So to place our current suffering and our current fears and anxieties in that context um, can sometimes seem overwhelming and at the same time it can potentially be sort of grounding in the sense that look we're passing through this very long historical period I mean if you look at the history of human beings in terms of hundreds of thousands of years this new book called the dawn of everything talks about that if you look at hundreds of thousands of years of human history which you know indigenous people are more likely to think in those terms um, we're passing through this very bad tumultuous, violent, hard, you know, period in, in human history. And, you know, there's some reason for hope we could all come out of it and start restoring our communities and, and restoring our natural environment. And, you know, it's just a question really of how much devastation and pain and suffering there's going to be before that could happen. But, but there's, there's, you're just in thinking in these terms, you're just entering into a very, very long um, 
struggle and um, and you, you kind of have to take a bigger time frame with any particular political struggle. If you look at people who are working to end slavery in 1820, you know, um, or or working for, you know, other forms, uh, you know, uh, people involved in other struggles lived at points where it was hopeless in the sense that it was not going to happen in their lifetime. Um, but, you know, sometimes things can get better. So anyway, um, <laughs> we're not really living at a unique moment of crisis. I mean, the planet is not going to go away. <laughs> the question of whether, you know, life as we know it is going to go away is, is open, uh -huh. but um, the planet will you know, just like when the meteor hit the dinosaurs, the planet will carry on. So um, it's just all part of the process anyway. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Carol. And so, yeah, all we can do is uh, decide that every day how we want to show up because we really don't know what the effect of that is. But we do know that there are ways to show up that contribute and uh, make things worse. And so we're just not gonna participate in that and figure out what we can do so that we, um, uh, what, regardless of what the outcome would be of that, at least we're not participating in the harm, uh, you know, where we can, yeah. Um, we have four minutes left, Priya. Is there some kind of closing that we need to do or we can just go on until this, we get kicked out of you? We can go on till we get kicked out. Okay. So in the chat, uh, anybody is free to talk, but in the chat, if, any, if you can just put one word or phrase that comes to mind, how you feel right now, having participated in this discussion, um, that would be useful uh, for me. And, and, and Raj, uh, there's a session tomorrow, I think something about tea. Uh, that's all I noticed in the title, but Shivani is the person who runs the center here in Johannesburg. That is very, a very, very cool center. It's a community center and it's really has its own flavor. Uh, when I met him, he didn't even use words like unschooling and self-directed education. He was just doing it. Um, so I think I would suggest you join him or connect with him at some point and you'll get some good ideas and see what they're up to via their social media page. Yeah? Okay. Oh, thanks, Bria. The sacred art of learning with a cup of tea. Okay. Um, I just noticed the tea part. Affirmed, inspired. Um, So yeah, a lot of these words, actually all of them resonate with me as well. Uh, it's really good to be able to come here and speak about uh, intersectional unschooling, feeling completely safe without my heart pumping, you know, um, and like, oh, I hope I don't get too much of, and I suppose because I knew where I'm coming, I knew it's going to be a safe space, I felt held, and um, the feedback it's giving me food for thought as well. So I save the chat and I'll go and read it later so that I can just reflect on that further. Um, and so thank you all for coming and sharing and being interested in this and for, um, for showing up, I guess, just wherever you are with whatever you're doing. Okay, I don't like to have the final words. <laughs> Anybody else want to say something? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks so much, Sakia. Really appreciate it. I'm wondering if you're willing to send your slides to us so we can share those out as well. Oh, okay, sure. I'll just check if there's any typos because they were really my own <laughs> notes and I'll send them to you for sure, definitely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, we'll be back in the main room. There will be a break, but I'm sure people will be chatting. So feel free to hang out there or take care of yourself. Do what your body needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pleasure. <laughs>